Gone with the Wind Chapter 1 Money Problems On a cold January afternoon in 1868, Scarlett O'Hara was writing to Aunt Pity when Will Benteen came into the room. Miss Scarlett, he said, how much money do you have? She stared at him, wondering if something was wrong. I've got ten dollars in gold, the last of that Yankee's money. That won't be enough for the taxes, he said, taxes, said Scarlet. We've already paid the taxes, Miss Scarlet. You don't go to Jonesboro often, and I'm glad you don't, he said. A lot of Yankees and carpetbaggers are giving the orders now. But what's that got to do with our taxes, said Scarlet. They are putting the value on Tara sky high, and you'll have to pay more tax, said Will. If you can't, Tara will be sold, and I've heard that somebody is hoping to get it cheap. Will and Ashley looked after any business in Jonesboro and had agreed not to tell Scarlett the more worrying details of what was happening. But Will could not hide this from her, those Yankees, she cried. Wasn't it enough for them to win the war? How much extra do they want us to pay? Three hundred dollars, said Will, then we've got to get three hundred dollars somehow, she said. They can't sell Tara. Will looked angry. They can and they'll enjoy doing it. The country has gone to hell, if you'll excuse my saying so, Miss Scarlet. Carpetbaggers and white trash can vote. And most southern gentlemen can't. Anyone who was on the tax books for more than 2,000 before the war can't vote. Men like your pa and Mr. Tolton. I could vote if I took their oath and became a Yankee, but I'll never do that. But people like Jonas Wilkerson and the Slatteries, they can vote, and they're giving the orders now. Vote, cried Scarlet. It's taxes we're talking about. Will, we could borrow money on Tara and, and who has any money to lend you on this place? Only the carpetbaggers who are trying to take it away from you. I've got the jewelry I took off the Yankee, Miss Scarlet, who has money for jewelry round here? Said Will. Most people ain't got enough money to buy meat. They were silent for several minutes. Where is Mr. Wilkes? She said he's in the field. Cut tin, wood, said Will. Scarlet had not had a private talk with Ashley since his return because Melanie was always with him, but she found him alone in the field and told him the news. Only one person we know has money, he said. That's Rhett Butler. A letter from Aunt Pity had said that Rhett Butler was back in Atlanta, looking rich. Don't talk about him, said Scarlet. What about us? Ashley stared across the fields. What will happen to everybody in the South, he said. I can't help, Scarlet. The world I belong to has gone, and I'm afraid. I can't make you understand these things because you're never afraid. You face the real world without wanting to escape it, but I can't. Escape, cried Scarlet. Oh, Ashley, I do want to escape. I'm so tired of it all. 
Let's run away. We could go to Mexico. They want officers in the Mexican army. You know you don't love Melanie. You told me you loved me that day at Twelve Oaks, and I know you haven't changed. We were going to forget that day at Twelve Oaks, he said. You told me you loved me that day at Twelve Oaks, and I know you haven't changed. Do you think I could ever forget it? She said his voice was deadly quiet. And do you think I could leave Melanie and the baby? Scarlet, you're sick and tired. That's why you're talking this way. But I'm going to help you dash. There's only one way to help me, she said. Take me away. There's nothing to keep us here. Only honor, he said quietly. She began to cry, and he took her into his arms and pressed her head against his chest, whispering, "You mustn't cry." And he kissed her hungrily, as if he could never have enough. "You do love me," she cried. "You do love me." Say it. He pushed her away. Don't, he said. Or I shall make love to you now, here in the field. She smiled, remembering the feel of his mouth on hers. We won't do this, he cried. And it will never happen again, because I'll take Melanie and the baby and go. Go. She cried. Oh no! Yes, by God, he said. Do you think I'll stay here now when this might happen again? But Ashley, you can't go. You love me. All right, I love you. And a moment ago, I almost took you. Like a. He could not find the words. Scarlet felt a cold pain in her heart. If you felt like that and didn't take me, then you don't love me, she said. I can never make you understand, he said. There's nothing left for me to fight for, she said. Dot. He picked up some of the red earth at his feet. There is something left, he said. Something you love better than me. There's Tara. And he pressed the wet earth into her hand. She looked down at it, and suddenly she knew how very dear that red earth of Tara was to her, and how hard she would fight to keep it. You needn't go, she said. It won't happen again. Chapter Two: Return to Atlanta. Scarlet heard the sound of a horse and saw a shiny new carriage stop by the house. Jonas Wilkerson got out. Scarlet was surprised to see the man who was once her father's plantation manager. Will had said that Jonas had made a lot of money, mostly by cheating Negroes or the government. And here he was stepping out of a fine carriage with a woman who was dressed in fashionable clothes. The woman looked towards the house, and Scarlet recognized her immediately. Emmy Slattery, she said before she could stop herself. Yes, it's me," said Emmy, holding her head proudly. Emmy Slattery. That dirty, cheap female whose fatherless baby Scarlett's mother had helped to deliver. Emmy, who gave typhoid to Scarlett's mother and killed her. That overdressed, nasty piece of white trash was coming up the steps of Tara, smiling and looking as if she belonged there. Get off those steps! 
cried Scarlet. Get off this land. Jonas tried to control his anger. You mustn't speak like that to my wife, he said. Wife, said Scarlet. So you've made her your wife at last, have you? We came to talk business with old friends, began Jonas. Friends, said Scarlet. My father threw you off this plantation after you fathered Emmy's baby. And the slatterers took our help and paid us back by killing my mother. Get off this land before I call Mr. Benteen and Mr. Wilkes. Emmy ran back to the carriage, but Jonas did not move. Still the proud lady, he shouted at Scarlet. Well, I know your father's gone crazy. And I know you can't pay your taxes. I came here to offer to buy this place, but I won't give you a dollar now. I eleven buy it cheap when it's sold for taxes. I'll pull this house down and plant every field with salt before either of you put a foot in it, shouted Scarlet. Jonas turned and walked angrily to the carriage. He climbed in next to his wife, who was crying, and they drove off. Scarlet was so frightened that she found it difficult to breathe. Jonas Wilkerson at Tara? Never. Never, never. I'll get money from Rhett, she thought. I'll sell him the Yankees jewelry, then I'll pay the taxes and laugh in Jonas Wilkerson's face. Another thought came to her. But I'll need money for taxes every year. What had Rhett said? I want you more than I've ever wanted any woman. I'll marry him, she thought coolly, then I'll never have to worry about money again. But he mustn't suspect that we're poor or he'll know it's his money I want and not him. Scarlet and Mammy stepped from the train at Atlanta. Scarlet had wanted to come alone but Mammy wouldn't let her. And because Mammy had helped Scarlet make a new dress from some curtains, Scarlet felt unable to stop her coming. Mammy knew about the taxes and that they were in Atlanta to get the money to pay them. Why ain't you saying where the money is calling from? She asked, suspecting something. And why do you need a new dress to borrow it? Scarlet didn't answer. They walked to Aunt Pity's house, saddened by the city's burned and blackened buildings. The streets were full of Yankee soldiers, or Negroes, who stared at Scarlet in an insulting way as she walked past. Dot a closed carriage came along Peachtree Street and a woman's head appeared at a window. It was Belle waiting. Who was that? Asked Mammy. I ain't never seen hair that color in my life. She's the town's bad woman, said Scarlet, and Mammy's mouth fell open. My dear, did I tell you that Red Butler was in prison? Aunt Pity said at supper that evening. For a moment, Scarlet was so shocked she could only stare. Yes, went on Aunt Pity. He's in prison for killing a Negro who insulted a white woman, and they may hang him. How, how long will he be in prison? asked Scarlet. Nobody knows, said Aunt Pity. And the Yankees don't care whether people are guilty or not, they are so worried about the Ku Klux Klan.
One, do you have a clan near Tara? I'm sure you do, and Ashley doesn't tell you about it. Clansmen aren't supposed to tell. They ride out at night, dressed like ghosts, and call on carpet beggars who steal and Negroes who are rude or insulting. Sometimes they frighten them and make them leave. Sometimes they kill them and leave them with the Ku Klux card on them. The Yankees are very angry about it, but I don't believe they'll hang Captain Butler because they think he knows where the money is. Everybody believes he's got millions of dollars in gold belonging to the Confederacy. Somebody got it, and we think it was the blockaders, millions, in gold. Scarlet imagined it. She could repair Tara and plant miles and miles of cotton. She could have pretty clothes and a good doctor to look after Pa. And Ashley, oh, she could do so much for Ashley. Chapter 3 Prison Visiting There were soldiers talking outside the Yankee prison. Scarlet, wearing her new dress, walked towards them. Can I help you? One asked politely. I want to see Captain Butler, said Scarlet. Butler again? That man's popular said the soldier. He was also a captain. Are you a relation? Yes, his, his sister, the captain laughed. He's got a lot of sisters. One of them was here yesterday. Come and wait in the office. Scarlet's face was red as she sat down on a chair and gave the soldier her name. After a time the door opened and Rhett appeared. He was dirty and hadn't shaved, but he came in with a smile and was obviously happy to see her. Scarlet, he said, laughing. My dear little sister. He kissed her cheek before she could stop him. Remember, my men are just outside. The captain said when the door closed after him, Brett moved towards her again. Can I give you a real kiss now, he said. She smiled at him. Only on the cheek, like a good brother. I'll wait and hope for better things, he said. When did you arrive in Atlanta? Yesterday. She replied. And you came here this morning? My dear, how good of you. Aunt Pity told me about you last night and I just couldn't sleep. I was so unhappy and worried about you, she said. Scarlet, it's wonderful to hear you say things like that, he said. How pretty you are. Let me look at you. She laughed and turned round on her toes. What have you been doing since I last saw you? He said. She sat down next to him and put a hand on his arm. The Yankees came to Tara, but they didn't burn the house. Everything is fine. We did well with our cotton last autumn. And Pa says we'll do better next year, but there are no parties, Rhett, and I get bored in the country. I came here to get some dresses, and then I'm going to Charleston to visit my aunt. She gently squeezed his arm. I'm so frightened for you, Rhett. They won't really hang you, will they? He put his hand on hers. Will you be sorry, he said. 
If you're sorry enough, I'll put you in my will. There was laughter in his eyes as he squeezed her hand at his will. She looked down quickly, but not before he saw the excitement in her face. He watched her closely as he spoke. The Yankees think I ran away with the Confederacy gold. Well, did you? She said. Where did you get all your money? Aunt Pity says. What rude questions you ask, he said, laughing. She was so excited it was difficult to talk sweetly to him. You're too clever to let them hang you, she said. You'll find a way to get out, and when you do, and when I do dash, he asked, moving closer to her, well, I, her face went prettily red again. Oh, Rhett, I'll die if they hang you. I, she stopped and looked down, Scarlet, you can't mean that you, she tried to cry. Would tears seem more natural? She closed her eyes but turned her face upward so that he could kiss her more easily. But he did not kiss her lips. He took her hand and kissed it, then turned it over to kiss the other side. It was rough from work, and the nails were broken. It wasn't the soft, white hand of Scarlet O'Hara. He picked up the other one and looked at them together. Look at me, he said, quietly. So everything is fine at Tara, is it? Well, these aren't the hands of a lady. Don't say that, she cried. But she was thinking, why didn't I wear Aunt Pity's gloves? How stupid. You've worked like a field negro, he said, dropping them. Why did you lie? I almost believed you were sorry for me, but I am sorry, she said. No, you aren't. You want something. Tell me what it is instead of behaving like a prostitute selling herself. He looked closely at her. Did you really think I'd marry you? Her face went red. You know I'm not a marrying man. He went on. Oh, Rhett, you can help me if you'll just be sweet. What do you want? Money? Well, yes, I do want some money. Said Scarlet. I want you to lend me $300. You were talking about love, but thinking about money, he said. How like a woman. What will you offer me in return? Jewelry, she said. I'm not interested in jewelry. He said, dot, there's Tara. No, he said. What do you want the money for? To pay taxes, said Scarlet. Oh, Rhett, I lied about everything being all right. Pa is not himself since Mother died. And there are thirteen of us to feed, and we never have enough to eat, or warm clothes, or... Where did you get the dress? he asked. It's made out of some curtains. She said dot he was silent for a moment, then he said, I don't like your first offer. Make me another one. She took a deep breath and looked him straight in the eye. You said you had never wanted a woman as much as you wanted me. Well, well, if you still want me, you can have me. He looked back at her and she felt her face getting hot. Then he said, let me understand this, 
If I give you three hundred dollars, you will be my lover. Is that right? Yes, she said. Are you going to give me the money? He smiled. I couldn't give it to you. I have the money, yes, but not here. And I'm not saying where it is or how much. Her face became ugly, and she jumped at him with an angry cry. He held her round the waist as she tried to bite and kick him. Let me go, she said. You knew you weren't going to give me the money, but you let me go on. You're a hateful pig. He laughed. Come to my hanging. It will make you feel better, he said. Thank you, she said. But they may not hang you until it's too late to pay the taxes. Chapter Four: Another Plan. It was raining when she started to walk back to Aunt Pity's house. Her clothes were soon wet, but she didn't care. How can I go back to Tara? And tell them they must all go somewhere. She thought. Oh, I hope they hang Red Butler. She heard the sound of a carriage and turned to look. The driver saw her. Is it Miss Scarlet? He said. Dot. Oh, Mr. Kennedy said. Scarlet. I'm so glad to see you. Frank Kennedy smiled and looked pleased as he stopped and helped her into the carriage. What are you doing in this part of the town? He said. Don't you know it's dangerous? Scarlet noticed how well dressed he was. The carriage was new, too. I didn't know you were here in Atlanta, she said. Didn't Miss Suellen tell you about my shop? Said Frank. No, she replied. Although she remembered Suellen did say something about it. A shop? How clever you must be! I came to Atlanta at the end of the war, he explained, and there were beds and blankets on the train which nobody seemed to want. The Yankees were going to burn them, but I got them first. One had ten dollars and used it to put a roof on an old shop near Five Points. And I moved the beds and blankets in and started selling them. I sold them cheap, then bought other things and sold those too. He looked proud. I made a thousand dollars this year, Miss Scarlet. Five hundred went to buy more things, but I'll probably make two thousand next year. And I've already got an idea for another business. Scarlet quickly became interested. You have, she said. Dot. He laughed and hurried the horse along. A pretty little woman like you doesn't want to hear anything about business. The old fool, she thought, but she said, "Oh, but I do," and smiled sweetly. What other business? A sawmill, he said. I haven't bought it yet, but I will. Anybody who owns a sawmill can make money. The Yankees burned so many houses, and people have gone crazy building new ones. They can't get enough wood, and they can't get it fast enough. I'm going to buy this sawmill as soon as people pay me some of the money they owe me. His face went red again. You know why I want to make money quickly, don't you? Scarlet knew he was thinking of Sue Ellen. 
For a moment, she wondered about asking him to lend her $300. But he won't, she thought. He wants to marry Sue Ellen in the spring, and if he lends me the money the wedding will have to wait. Oh, why does this old fool want to marry her? Once she gets her hands on his money, she won't care whether Tara is sold for taxes or burned to the ground. Suddenly, an idea came into her head. Can I make him forget Suellen and ask me to marry him instead? He's old enough to be my father. But he's a gentleman, and now isn't the time for me to be fussy, he saw her staring at him, and she looked away quickly, are you cold, he asked. Yes, she said, in a small voice. May I put my hand in your coat pocket? I forgot to bring my gloves, oh, of course, he said, delighted. But why did you come to this part of town? I, I went to see if the soldiers would buy some clothes I had made to send home to their wives. She lied, you went to the Yankees, he said, shocked. Miss Scarlet, does Miss Pittipat know that you? Oh, I shall die if you tell Aunt Pity, said Scarlet and began to cry. It was easy to cry because she was so cold. Frank became embarrassed. He wanted to put her head on his shoulder, but didn't know what to do. I came to Atlanta to try to make a little money for myself and my son, said Scarlet, tears running down her cheeks. And then Frank saw that her head was on his shoulder, although he didn't know how it had got there. I won't tell Miss Pittipat, he said, but you must promise not to do anything like this again, her green eyes looked up at him. But I must do something. There's nobody to look after me or my poor little boy now. There will always be a home for you and wait with us when Miss Sue Ellen and I are married, he said. Scarlet tried to look embarrassed. I s something wrong, said Frank. I, I thought she wrote to you, said Scarlet. Oh, she should be ashamed. Oh, what an unkind sister I have. Frank stared at her, his face grey. What? She's going to marry Tony Fontaine next month, lied Scarlet. She got tired of waiting for you. During the next two weeks, Scarlet made him feel like a strong, Warm-hearted man who was lucky enough to catch a charming but helpless little woman. And when they stood together to be married, he still did not know how it had all happened. And so quickly too. He only knew that for the first time in his life he had done something wonderful and exciting. No friends or relations came to the wedding. That was how Scarlet wanted it. Just us two, Frank, she said. I always wanted to run away and be married. Please, dear, just for me. And before he knew it, he was married. Chapter 5 The Sawmill Business Frank gave Scarlet the $300 although it ended his hopes of buying the sawmill. But she let him see how happy this made her, and then he was happy, too. 
Will wrote to say the taxes were now paid and that Jonas Wilkerson was angry not to get Tara. Scarlett knew that Will understood why she had married Frank, but wondered what Ashley thought of her. She also had a letter from Sue Ellen. A violent, insulting letter. And though many of the things Sue Ellen said were true, Scarlett never forgave her for saying them. She knew people in Atlanta were talking about her, but she did not care. Tara was safe. Now she had to make Frank realize that his shop must bring in more money. There were next year's taxes to pay and there was still the sawmill. Scarlett knew that there was money to be made from the sawmill. Nobody knew just when Frank realized that Scarlett had tricked him into marrying her. Sue Ellen certainly never wrote to tell him. Perhaps it was when Tony Fontaine came to Atlanta on business, obviously not married. But Frank could not believe Scarlett had married him coldly and without any love. Two weeks after the wedding he became ill, and Dr. Mead sent him to bed. As each day passed, Frank worried more and more about the shop and the boy who was looking after it for him. I'll go and see how things are, Scarlett told him. When she arrived, she sent the boy out for his dinner then looked at the books to see just how much money people owed Frank. She was shocked to find it was more than $500. And owed by people she knew, the Elsings and the Merryweathers, among others. Frank may be willing to stay poor just to be friendly with these people, she thought but I'm not. She was making a list of the names when the door opened and someone came in. It was Rhett Butler.my dear Mrs. Kennedy, he said. My very dear Mrs. Kennedy. She stared at him. What are you doing here, she said. I heard you were married. So I came to congratulate you, oh, you are the most dash. What a pity they didn't hang you. There are others who share your opinion, he said, smiling. How did you get out of prison, she asked. I persuaded a government friend of mine in Washington to speak for me, he said. I knew things about him that he didn't want others to know. But you were guilty, she said, yes, I did kill the Negro, agreed Rhett. He insulted a lady. He spoke softly. And don't tell Miss Pittipat, but, yes, I do have the money, safe in a bank in England. The money, said Scarlet. You have the Confederate gold? Not all of it, he said, laughing. There must be fifty or more blockaders who have some. But I've got nearly half a million. If only you had waited and not rushed to marry again. Scarlet felt sick. Half a million dollars. It was hard to believe there was so much money in this cruel world. Tell me, he said, trying not to look too interested, but failing, did you get the money for the taxes? And suddenly, she knew that this was why he was here. It was not to laugh at her, but to make sure she had got the money to pay the taxes. Oh. How nice he could be sometimes.
Did he really care about her more than he was willing to say? Yes, I got the money, she said. Did you wait until you had the wedding ring on your finger? He said, smiling, and did Frank have as much money as he told you? Or did he trick you? You needn't have secrets from me, Scarlet. I know the worst about you, oh, Rhett, you're the worst. Well, I don't know what. No. Frank didn't trick me, but dash, suddenly it was good to tell someone her troubles. Rhett, if Frank would just ask people for the money they owe him, I wouldn't be worried. Don't you have enough to live on? He said, yes, but, well, I could use a little money, I'll lend you some money, but I want to know what it's for, said Rhett. He smiled again. And I won't ask you to repeat that charming offer you made me once, Yura, she began, I know you're worrying about that, he went on, smoothly. Not worrying a lot, but worrying a little. Now, why do you want money? Not for Ashley Wilkes, I hope, she became hot with anger. Ashley Wilkes has never taken a dollar from me. Ashley is? Oh, yes, he said. Ashley is wonderful. So why doesn't he take his family and get out of Tara and find work? He's been working like a field negro. His. Yes. He does the best he can, but you'll never make a farm worker out of a Wilkes. Now, cool down and tell me how much money you want and what you want it for. Scarlet tried to control her anger. She wanted to throw his offer back in his face, but she told herself to be sensible. I want to buy a sawmill, she said at last. And I think I can get it cheap. And I want two wagons and horses, and a horse and carriage for myself. A sawmill, said Rhett, yes, she said. Are you busy this afternoon? Why, he asked, I want you to drive to the sawmill with me, she said. I want to buy it before you change your mind. The sawmill, cried Frank. You sold your jewelry to Captain Butler and bought the sawmill? It was the shock of Frank's life when Scarlet told him. At first he thought she was joking, but he soon discovered that it was no joke. Early each morning she drove out to the sawmill with Uncle Peter. Aunt Pity's old slave, and did not come back until it was dark. A man called Johnson was made manager, and he brought in free Negroes to do the work. And Scarlet was soon earning enough money to talk about buying another sawmill. Frank couldn't understand it. This wasn't the soft, Sweet, helpless person he had married this Scarlet knew what she wanted, and went after it, like a man. And she became angry so easily. He only had to say, Scarlet, I wish you wouldn't, and it was like a thunderstorm breaking, a baby, he thought. She needs a baby. Then, on a wild wet night in April, Tony Fontaine rode in from Jonesboro and knocked on their door, waking up Frank and Scarlet. Frank hurried down to let him in. Scarlet followed moments later, 
and came downstairs as Tony blew out the lighted candle Frank was holding. They'll hang me if they catch me. Tony was saying, I'm going to Texas to hide, but I need another horse. Frank, you can have mine, said Frank. What happened? Scarlet asked, you remember Eustace, who was one of our slaves? Said Tony. Fi came to the kitchen today, while Sally was making dinner. I don't know what he said, but I heard her scream and try to get away. I ran into the kitchen. And there he was, drunk go on, said Scarlet, I shot him, and when mother ran in to look after Sally. I began riding into Jonesboro to find Jonas Wilkerson. He was to blame. Fi had talked to those black fools and told them that Negroes could have anything, could have white women. Oh, Tony, no, cried Scarlet, yes, said Tony. On my way past Tara I met Ashley and he went with me. We found Wilkerson in a bar. And I took my knife to him while Ashley held the others back. It was finished before I knew it. Wilkerson was dead and Ashley was putting me on my horse and telling me to come to you. He's a good man, Ashley. But surely if you went back and explained Dash, Tony laughed. Scarlet. How do you think the Yankees will reward a man for keeping Negroes off his women? By hanging him, that's how. Now, I must go. Scarlet was afraid. Someone could rape or kill her, and the Yankees would hang anyone who tried to punish the criminal. She didn't want her children to grow up with all this hate and fear. She wanted them to know only warm homes, good clothes and fine food, only money can buy these things, she thought. Lots of money. That's what I'll have, and I don't care how I get it. Scarlet followed moments later and came downstairs as Tony blew out the lighted candle Frank was holding. When Tony had gone, Scarlet told her husband a secret she had kept for several weeks. Frank, she said, I'm going to have a baby. The spring months went by, and each day Scarlet went to the sawmill, certain that Johnson the manager was cheating her, but unable to catch him. And she went to see builders and people who were planning new homes. She often lied about the quality of her wood, and sold bad wood for the same price as good wood. One man who owned another sawmill openly called her a liar and a cheat, but it hurt his business because people would not believe that someone like Scarlet, a lady, would behave the way this man was saying she did. In the end, the man had to sell his business, and Scarlet bought it cheap. She had to find someone to manage the second sawmill. And she gave the job to Hugh Elsing. He was not a good businessman, but he was honest. People were shocked to see Scarlet doing business with Yankees. But Scarlet did not care. When I'm rich, she thought, I'll say what I think of them, but until then I'll smile sweetly and take their money. Then in early June, a message came from Wola Tara. Gerald, Scarlet's father, was dead.